Thank you very much. I am uh, back again to speak again about carbon and climate and to remind my colleagues that it is long past time for us to wake up and to address the causes and consequences of global climate change. Carbon pollution is changing our world, and it's time that our national policies reflect the reality of that changing climate. We can't pretend that the change is not going to happen when it's actually already happening all around us. Air and ocean temperatures are increasing. Sea level is rising. Oceans are growing more acidic. Seasons are shifting. And extreme events like heat waves or powerful storms are becoming both more frequent and more intense. Well-established science tells us that these changes are caused by carbon pollution in our atmosphere mostly from burning fossil fuels. These changes to our planet will continue and likely accelerate, and the consequences will be dire. So we had better be aware and prepared. Sometimes even little changes can have big effects. Take, for example, the winter flounder in the waters of Narragansett Bay in my home state of Rhode Island. I'm sure the presiding officer's home state has winter flounder as well. Well, many of our colleagues won't give a hoot about the winter flounder. But Congress always tends to care a lot about money. And the winter flounder has historically been a very popular and lucrative catch for Rhode Island fishermen. In the 1980s, commercial landings of winter flounder averaged more than 2,500 metric tons per year. And as recently as 1989, it was still over 1,000 metric tons. Trawlers were a common sight on the bay in the winter, and fishermen prospered. Well, now, the most recent data is for 2009, and the commercial landing of winter flounder is down to about 150 metric tons, from 2,500 metric tons down to 150. And today, trawlers in the bay are a rare sight. Narragansett Bay waters are getting warmer, four degrees Fahrenheit warmer in the winter since the 1960s. And spring is coming earlier. And that is not good for the winter flounder. NOAA scientists working in Rhode Island found that winter flounder incubated in warmer water are smaller when they hatch than those incubated in colder water. Smaller juveniles are easier prey when predators return with the warmer spring water. The juvenile winter flounder used to have time to settle to the bottom of the bay and to grow larger before the abundant bottom feeders like the sand shrimp were present. But now, warmer water brings the shrimp in earlier, while the flounder is still small enough to eat. So, warmer waters load the dice against winter flounder in Narragansett Bay, and the fishermen who relied upon them pay the price. They pay a real price. These changes in Rhode Island are not unique to Rhode Island. You can go find examples all over the country. Over on the Pacific coast, ocean acidification, driven by higher levels of carbon dioxide in the water, is killing off baby oysters as they try to form their shells in the acidified water. Again, I don't know how many colleagues care about baby oysters, but oyster farming is a serious cash crop on the Pacific coast. An oyster hatchery in Oregon has seen 70 to 80 percent losses of its oyster larvae due to more acidic waters washing in from the sea. It's not just our oceans and coasts that are affected, and our heartland rivers and forests are facing the changes that come with the warming climate. 
The water hyacinth is an invasive species spreading rapidly across the southern United States, blocking waterways and choking native species. The water hyacinth has been called the world's worst aquatic weed. The pest renders a body of water unsuitable for most other plants and animals, drains water from the drinking and irrigation supply, and can clog pumping stations and hydropower infrastructure, costing local economies millions of dollars. Water hyacinths can't survive a winter freezing, but as average temperatures warm, this invasive species spreads further and further. In the Rockies, pine beetles are devastating native forests. The pine beetle larvae are killed by hard frosts. And so this kept them in lower latitudes and in lower altitudes where the temperature was warmer. But with global warming and winters not so cold, the beetle is spreading northward and upward to higher elevations. So fly over Idaho and Montana and look down at miles and miles of what was once green pine forest now standing dead on the mountainsides. These forests provided timber, hunting, clear streams, and an entire forest environment for birds and animals. And it doesn't look like they're ever coming back. Winter flounder, baby oysters, water hyacinth, pine beetles, these species pinpoint just a few of the many changes scientists are observing in nearly every corner of our country. Thankfully, we now have the beginnings of a blueprint for adapting to these changes. Last month, the Obama administration, in partnership with state and tribal agencies, released its first national fish, wildlife, and plants adaptation strategy, an attempt to understand and head off, or at least prepare for, the changes carbon pollution is beginning to wreak on our country's wildlife, plants, coasts, and rivers. Jamie Rappaport Clark, the president and CEO of Defenders of Wildlife, called the adaptation plan a science-based, common sense, look before you leap strategy that emphasizes long-term planning and management for climate change on a fundamental level. The adaptation strategy stresses that we need research to understand the specific effects of climate change on local fish, wildlife, plants, and habitat. The faster you're driving, the better your headlights need to be. And it's scientific research that provides the headlights for us to see what's now coming at us. And we are past the point of avoiding what's coming at us. The big polluters have seen to that with their lobbyists and their money and their lies, they have prevented us from doing what we should have. And of course, Congress shares the blame. This institution prefers listening to self-interested polluters than listening to science or the signals of nature. So there's no avoiding it now. The National Wildlife Federation now recommends managing for change rather than maintaining status quo conditions and urges that federal land and water management agency agencies should explicitly incorporate climate change projections into their resource management planning. A coalition of 21 groups, including American Rivers, National Audubon Society, Physicians for Social Responsibility, the Wilderness Society, and the World Wildlife Fund has urged the federal government to account for climate change in all relevant programs and activities. They called this adaptation strategy a landmark strategy for making wildlife and ecosystems more resilient to climate impacts. Resilient. 
to climate impacts. Clearly, they recognize that climate impacts are inevitable. Indeed, they're happening. The question is how bad they're going to be, how much damage we will let the polluters do before we bring them to heel and ourselves to our senses. The Natural Resources Defense Council echoed a recent Government Accountability Office finding that our current adaptation planning is inadequate and that this, for those who only care about money, this increases the federal government's fiscal exposure to climate change. A group of 10 outdoor enthusiasts and sportsmen's groups led by the Wildlife Management Institute recently urged President Obama, quote, to stand firm on his commitment to develop and implement climate change adaptation strategies because they know we have to adapt. The alarm has long been sounded by the scientific community, which overwhelmingly warns about the effects of our carbon dioxide emissions on our atmosphere and oceans. Our defense and intelligence communities warn of the threats posed by climate change to national security and international stability. Economists recognize the market distortion of overlooking the cost of carbon pollution. And let me say a word of appreciation to former Secretary George Shultz, who in the New York Times wrote an excellent piece pointing out that this is indeed a market distortion that favors polluting fossil fuels and gives them an unfair advantage against other forms of energy that would do less damage to our planet. And of course, government accountants list climate change as a threat to our fiscal stability. Even faith leaders, faith leaders appeal to our moral responsibility to shield communities and particularly the poorest communities here at home and around the globe from the devastating effects of carbon pollution on God's earth. And now, the alarm is sounded by those dedicated to the conservation of America's wild spaces and living creatures. They are warning that, thanks to Congress's neglect, change is coming to our planet, locality by locality. They are warning that we had better understand and prepare for those changes and do what we can to minimize the eventual havoc. Madam President, the American people are not sitting idly by on this. They are demanding action. Three quarters of those recently surveyed by Stanford University think the federal government should do something to reduce the effects of rising sea levels. My Newport tidal gauge in my home state and the famous sailing port of Newport is up 10 inches since the famous hurricane of 1938. When the next really big one comes, that 10 inches is going to mean a lot of additional damage. Americans believe that national preparations for the climate change that's around us will more likely help the economy than hurt it. And they're right. These changes will help the economy. 60% of Americans believe that taking steps now to adapt would actually create more jobs, while only 13% thought it would create fewer jobs. 60% to 13% of Americans recognize that the real economic strength that we'll get is by addressing this problem, not by ducking it because of the pressure from the carbon polluters. Americans clearly see the benefits of adapting for climate change. And again, for those who only care about money, Americans see the economic benefits of addressing climate change. And so, Madam President, I will say once again, it is time 
for us here in Congress to wake up. We are sleepwalking through history. We are asleep to the urgent demands of our time. So it's time to wake up and prepare our national strategy to protect our nation's precious resources, protect our coasts and forests and plains, protect our animal and plant life, protect our people and our communities against the inexorable change that looms. I thank the President and I yield the floor.